a lot of different things. But Haystack Rock, it's one of those images that you think of. When you think of Oregon, you probably think of rain, trees, maybe Mount Hood, but you're probably going to think about Haystack Rock. But which Haystack Rock are you going to think about? Because Haystack Rock, there's um, about 30 in the United States, formerly and informally known as Haystack Rock, believe it or not. And they date back millions of years to the same volcanic activity. Um, so they're volcanic basalt rock, and they're beautiful. And as um, Angela mentioned, there's sea sacks all along the Oregon coastline. Haystack Rock has been known as the third largest monolith in the world. Um, which, as I was researching this talk, I was trying to substantiate. So if you go back 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, and they talk about Haystack Rock, whatever they're re referencing when they talk about it, they mention that it's the third largest monolith in the world, which is monolith, single stone. But there's actually many different definitions of that, because the Haystack Rock in Pacific City actually stands 327 feet tall. Haystack Rock in Cannon Beach stands 235 feet tall. So what does it mean? Well, it's supposed to be the third largest mon freestanding monolith in the world, which means you can walk around it. Um, and that's going to kind of come into play. We're going to play a little game, and it's called Haystack Rock Pacific City or Haystack Rock Cannon Beach. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm, you guys are all going to get these right. Um, but I don't know. So obviously, you guys are probably going to be staring at this picture. What do you think? Cannon Beach or Pacific City? Cannon Beach, you are right. Pacific City or Cannon Beach? Yes. Pacific City or Cannon Beach? Hey, you guys are good. I thought that was going to get you. Pacific City or Cannon Beach? Nice. Yes. Pacific City or Cannon Beach? Dang, I thought this one was going to get you. This photo is from the 1940s, and it doesn't show what I call the boob. The little, the little arch, the volcanic arch coming off of the Haystack Rock in Pacific City. I also think that Haystack Rock in Pacific City is just a little chunkier, but maybe I'm biased because I think that Haystack Rock in Cannon Beach is pretty awesome. Um, but it is not accessible. It's surrounded by water, and you can tell where this woman is sitting, you cannot legally go anymore. Uh, but this was a, a PR stunt that the Oregon Department of Transportation, which it was known as something else in the 40s, when they completed the highway, all the bridges, all the tunnels, they did this PR stunt, and they hired all these beautiful ladies and these hunky gentlemen to play, frolic, and sit in front of the most iconic images of Cannon Beach. Most of their shots were done in Cannon Beach in front of East Jack Rock. Obviously, this is Pacific City. They also did some along the coastline. They did a really weird photo shoot in front of Hub Point with um, archers that aren't actually pointing at the bullseye. Um, so kind of dangerous. If you ever want to see the picture of South the Museum, I didn't want to bring it here because it's very confusing. Um, so as I said, the differences between the rock in Pacific City and um, Haystack Rock here in Cannon Beach are its stature, instead of saying chunky, um, and obviously this little archway, it's, you're never going to see a picture where it's free of water. It's going to be surrounded with water, and it doesn't have the needles. And here's something I'm going to throw at you. Now, I've worked at the museum for about a decade, and daily people will come in that are driving the Oregon coastline, and they say, gosh, I saw all these haystack rocks. There's so many haystack rocks. There's one in California and one in Hampton. It's humans, we're super creative. So we see something and we say, wow, that looks, that looks like a stack of hay, haystack. I'm so amazing. That's why there's 30 formally and informally known. This is actually Morro Rock in Morro Bay, California. And I've had arguments with people that this is not haystack. This is not actually known as haystack. I don't know if it's informally known as haystack. But I think a lot of the confusion lies in a movie called 1941. Um, and that movie was filmed in California and in Cannon Beach. And Haystack Rock is prominently featured. But if you look up the film, it doesn't really talk about being filmed in Cannon Beach. So we talk about memories a lot in history. And when I write articles or I do interviews and people argue with me about facts, and we'll talk about a lot of things that people have argued with me about, I always talk about three reliable sources, and memory is usually not one of those. Um, and I am 
very bad with my memory, because I always thought there was a haystack rock in California, and I realized it's because I watched the movie 1941, and I knew they filmed some in Cannon Beach, but I also in my head knew that they filmed in California. Um, if you're curious about what other movies Haystack Rock has starred in besides Haystack uh, Goonies, which I know my generation should love, Sometimes a Great Notion with Paul Newman and Henry um, Fonda? 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 Oh God. This is why I take notes on names. Um, they have a scene where they, they fight in front of Haystack Rock, and a lot of people don't know that they did a little scene in Cannon Beach. They did. Um, so, yep, stack of hay. Uh, this photo is from Denmark from 2002, so it's still a process they use. Mostly in the U.S., we use machinery to process hay, so you don't see that often here, at least on the West Coast. It's way too wet to just leave hay out like this. Um, now I'm going to get into some stuff. And if you guys are ready to take some notes, we're going to talk some dates. Um, this is a picture that I found in our archives. The person who donated it um, is no longer with us. There was a pencil note that said 1923. And I thought, that can't be 1923. There's a sign there. Why would there be a sign there in 1923? So I posted it on, on our social media, and an argument ensued. People started analyzing the size of the tires. It got a little, it, it got a little intense the conversation. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Now, my favorite story, or one of my favorite stories that kind of got expanded upon when I was researching this talk, um, was in 1904, a gentleman named Mulholland uh, tried to do a land claim at the tippity top of Haystack Rock. And I had always thought, oh, he's you know, just going to up his claim by building his homestead, one house. As I'm researching this, I discovered he actually had a theory to do 12 plaques. Can you imagine 12 houses? And I can't, I can't even fathom it. And I know that when they constructed the Tomah Rock Lighthouse, they had to blast off the top of the rock to flatten it out in order to construct the lighthouse. Was that his idea? How did, how did they get to the top? Is he, is he a time traveler that can make an amazing elevator that will work in this coastal weather? Um, so it was, it was one of those stories where it was crazy for one house, but the idea that he thought there should be 12, thank goodness his land claim was denied. But what, what it brought up was this idea of where people should be building, where people should have private areas. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Governor Oswald West. He built um, another iconic image of Cannon Beach, which is the log cabin. Um, that you see when you walk the coast, when you're walking on the beach in Cannon Beach. It's kind of, you know, on the other side of this image. It's actually constructed on another basalt rock. Um, and Oswald West, he fell in love with the beach here, and he fell in love with Haystack Rock. And he felt like we should try and keep beaches open to everybody. He's tra he traveled around, and he felt that they should always be accessible. So this idea of the beaches being for everybody in Oregon is kind of born. And that's going to come in later. Um, so then we're going to talk about people, and we're going to come back to this picture, but we're going to talk about some, um, some science and some things. So in 1914, there's a gentleman, um, his name is Edison Wingard, and he is out fishing with a buddy of his on one of the rocks near Haystack Rock. They start about 7 a.m., they fish for a couple hours, the tide starts to change, and they decide to leave. And Edison decides, well, I'm gonna climb that rock. So he strips down to his bathing suit because I don't know anything about climbing, but apparently not wearing clothing is part of that. Um, kind of sketchy to me, but if you are a rock climber and you're like, yes, it's better to be naked, Fine. Um, so he's in his bathing suit. Of course, in the 1910s, a bathing suit is pretty much like shorts and a shirt and it's wool. Um, he decides to climb it and his buddy goes, well, okay, I'm going back to the house. Uh, he goes back, hours and hours pass by and they start to worry. They get a search party. People start looking. They take a boat out. They cannot find him. Um, he apparently was climbing the northwest corner of the rock. Uh, of Haystack Rock, um, and then finally about 8 o'clock at night, and rescuers have come because Cannon Beach at the time, they didn't have a police department, they didn't have lifeguards, uh, they weren't incorporated, 
and there wasn't really any source. So the article says rescuers. I'm not sure what that means. It may just be some dudes in the area that are like, hey, we're going to come help. Um, they look and look, can't find him. They look for him for several days. They, they never recover his body. Um, so this is August of 1914. And so at the end of the article, it says that this gentleman was really active in the community. People were very saddened by it. And it talks about several things, but it says that there is a tablet put at the rock in memory of C. Edison Wingard, who gave his life in an attempt to climb this rock, August 7, 1914. Uh, they go on to say that the rock stands about 250 to 300 feet, apparently. That's, you know, they can't quite measure, but... Um, and then they talk about, an, in addition on the tablet, that they write, perhaps um, it will keep people from climbing, so there's a deterrent, and it says something, do not try, do not attempt the impossible climb. And so there was a sign or tablet there in 1914. Uh, there was another article written in 1923 that talks about the climbers, and the, so there's climbers and there's hikers. And it says, do not climb. And it was white and black, according to the article. And this photo, coincidentally, was dated in 1923. So potentially, that could be the sign. And the sign was supposed to be at the start of the trail. And this might be, some people may know that there was a trail, some people don't. So there was a trail that you could take to the top of the rock, or just about the top. And accounts from people who successfully made it to the top say, it started out about a two foot width, and as you reached the top, it was less than 12 inches wide. So if you can imagine, you get up to that rock, that point, and then you look down and you can't see the trail anymore. So people would make attempts to find the trail and fall to their deaths, or they would just stay at the top and hope to be rescued. Um, the article in 1914 says that no one has successfully um, climbed the rock in the last 20 years. So I don't know if that means that people tried and they, were, they died or they fell, or if they just said, nope, I'm not doing it. Um, it's not very clear. So it's clear, I mean, 1914, 20 years, we're talking late 1800s, people are like, hey, there's a really cool rock, I'm gonna climb it. And it seems like a good idea. Um, so here's a guy. His name was Earl Hardy, uh, 1935. He's a seasonal worker at the Natatorium. The Nat in downtown Cannon Beach. It's a white building. It's still there. It's not a Natatorium. It's condos now. Uh, but it's kind of um, two buildings north of Gary Moon's mechanic shop. Uh, they used to have a sign on the building. I don't know if it's any, it is there anymore. So he used to work there in the summer. And apparently his daily exercise routine was to climb Haystack Rock. I don't think so. I think that is, that is not true. But he successfully climbed the rock in 1935 and was supposedly the first person to do it. And he did it with no shirt, tennis shoes, and really short shorts, because those, those look super short. Um, he used, yeah, he used a cold chisel and a hammer, which he used to cut handholds and toe grips to the rock. Now, I'm not a rock climber, but I have been told basalt rock tends to erode and chip and is not safe for rock climbing. Um, he made three attempts. His fastest attempt to the top was one and a half hours. This photo is supposedly him at the top of the rock. Oh, yeah, like the photographer went up there with all that equipment. <laughs> um, he was probably like, here's this really small rock. Just sit right there in your short shorts. Um, so he's the three-time winner because he made it successfully to the top. I can't imagine he was the only person to make it to the top by this point based on the articles I read and quite a few people wanted to do this. And I think a lot of us, we there's that need to know. There, we want to know, we want to conquer, manifest destiny, that human desire. Um, there's also, like, I would never do that because I like living. Um, and this is a really great photo of the lifeguards uh, in the 40s, uh, which is about when that lifeguard program in Cannes Beach was started. And so after Mr. Hardy's hiking up that, or climbing up the rock, um, okay, look at this idiot. And I'm gonna say idiot, because he, he lived. Um, this is some 23-year-old guy in Portland. This is 1967. He climbed up the rock, he used the trail, and he got stuck at the top. 
And I think this is a great picture because you can see the disturbance of just one person hiking up there. Look at the birds. And so they're, they're going to take a helicopter with all those birds in the air. And I don't, how many of you um, have seen Indiana Jones' Last Crusade with Sean Connery? You know, the birds in the sky, in the air, and then he takes down. The, so it's not safe. And there's a lot of reasons why this isn't safe. Besides just that guy, it's not safe for him. It's not safe for the helicopter pilot. It's not safe for the people on the ground. And it's really devastating to the wildlife. And so Cannon Beach, we have this culture of conservation. And I was really interested in when that started for our community. Now, you know, obviously Oswald West really fell in love with Cannon Beach and he tried to establish some things. Um, World War II, when it was over, there was this influx of people, house construction, um, people moving to Cannon Beach, a lot more living there year round than there was before. And so you have a lot more people from Portland, you have a lot more people from Seattle, you have a lot of people from different areas kind of coming together. And this was a daily event in the summer. Every day they were rescuing someone. And so this is frustrating for people for a lot of reasons. So there was a gentleman that lived in Cannon Beach, his name was Mr. Bentley. Bentley um, would find nests full of baby birds, he'd find birds, and he was familiar with the Audubon Society in Portland. He reached out to them and started trying to take care of the birds. He didn't know what he was doing, there was nothing really established, so he lost some, but he started saving and releasing birds that this was happening to. Um, and he reached out um, to the uh, Bureau, let me get the name right because it's different than it is, of uh, Land, of Fish, and Wildlife. He um, also, John Young, who is a Portland architect, reached out to them, the Coast Guard, people were getting sick of this. So in the 60s, Cannon Beach had a lot going on. There was the 64 tsunami, there were a storm and a flood every year. Uh, after the 64 tsunami, the community was really worried about tourism and about how they were gonna get them back. One of the plans was to talk the power company and just bringing power down to the rock, uh, which they did, and then they lit the rock up with floodlights, which freaked the birds out, it was a disaster. They only did it for two nights. So there was a lot going on here. And then of course, the beach bill with Tom McCall, there's people very concerned with what's going on with the beaches. And there's a conversation about Haystack Rock, not just as a rock, but as an ecosystem. And how are we affecting these animals? So a gentleman at the Bureau of Land and Fish Wildlife, he says, you know what? Dynamite. I'm gonna <laughs> blow it up. <laughs> and that's what they did. They came out in October of 68. Incidentally, they had just made it a wildlife refuge, so it was already a wildlife refuge. Let's take a look at this picture of the, that, the guys looking at the picture. So this is um, Mr. Bentley, and he's concerned about the birds. They talk about they talk to the Coast Guard. Um, oh, hey, okay, now there's the sign. Okay, we're going to blow up right next to it. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so they blast the cleft off so people can no longer access the trail to get to the top of the rock. Um, and if, if I don't know how many of you, by a raise of hands, have heard of the Florence Whale incident. Yes. Same guy. Same guy. Um, you got a stinky whale on your beach? Dynamite it up, baby. Um, so I have the report from the Land Fish and Wildlife for these guys. And um, now a lot of people in Cannon Beach knew this was happening. They were very secretive about it. But, because they're a public entity, they did release a statement, and um, here's the quote here, which I love it. So a lot of people obviously come to Cannon Beach, and they love it, and they fall in love, and they think that Haystack Rock is just this beautiful, amazing thing. And so he, they claim that the blast did not change the face of the rock in any way. And honestly, like pictures before and after, it's very hard to see and to tell exactly because the trail was so small. I don't know if they used all the dynamite um, because there's not a, a lot of information about that. But I do know when I wrote the article about it in 2012, a lot of people got upset. And they came in the museum to yell at me because there was no way that anyone would blow up Haystack Rock. I, 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 when I write, I'm not dramatic. I just said, hey, they you know, used some dynamite to blast off the trail. Um, articles, however, in the 60s, uh, Landmark dynamited 
uh, Oregon. So this was Chronicles of Centralia, a Wyoming newspaper, um, compared the blasting of Haystack Rock to the bombing of the Philadelphia Bell. So if you guys ever read an article and you're like, wow, oh, that's super dramatic. Yeah, that's, that's news. And it's still like that. Um, so they, people were really upset about it. And when I wrote about it, I was like, I have to have a lot of sources for this. And the Seaside Signal, they weren't kind of, they didn't have their archives in the state that they have. So the archives became accessible. These photos came to light for an Oregonian article that came out this last summer. And um, people were, were surprised, but they kind of already knew about it because I talked about it at nauseam. Um, so we're, this is a little fast forward, but so in 1968, they blast it, and they take the, the hiking trail off. But people are still climbing it. People are getting all over that. They keep changing the signs out. Um, but there's not any like interpretation. And when we talked about Pacific City, we talk about how Haystack Rock there, it's, it's surrounded by water. You're not having to worry about people jumping and climbing and crawling all over it. Haystack Rock, if the tide gets low enough, you can walk all the way around it. Um, so that becomes very evident in 1983 um, when Mr. Main and his wife go down to the beach with some scopes just like this to look at the rock and to look at the birds and they can't make it through the day. They're constantly being asked questions and they realize that wow, people really want to know. They don't just look at this and go, oh that rock is really cool and it's really pretty. They really want to know about the birds. They want to know about the, the marine life. They're very intrigued by what's happening. Um, so they work with the city, they work with some other people, and they put together the Haystack Rock Awareness Program in 1985. So it took them some time to convince people that this was needed. Um, and coincidentally, it's the same year that Cannes Beach makes it illegal to drive on the beach, unless you have some permitting, apparently. Um, but you can't drive there, and so they established the Haystack Rock Awareness Program. Now, when I was a kid, in my, you know, I went to Cannon Beach Elementary, we would go down there for field trips, and the Haystack Rock Awareness Program would talk to us about the marine life and about the tides. And I think it was, for me, it's just an important part because we live here, and if I'm a kid, I need to know what the tides are going to, how they're going to shift. I need to know not to just jump on a sea star or something like that, because it's not something you, you're born just knowing. Although hopefully you're not you know, a sociopath and just want to kill people and kill or kill creatures. Um, but you know, I don't know. Kids, kids are weird. Uh, I have a four-year-old, and they're they're weird. Um, if you forgot. Um, so the Haystack Rock Awareness Program, I think, is a really important part. I was a part of that program as a child. My son is now a part of their summer program, and. It, it's that culture of conservation that has happened in our communities here at the coast that you don't see on the East Coast because the beaches are privatized or because you're, they're not accessible or people aren't just, they're not talking about it. I feel like we talk about it to the point people don't want to hear it anymore, but I think you need to keep talking about it. You need to keep talking about the conservation that's happening. And I mean, the prime example, in 1973, you know, a gentleman had a helicopter and he just wanted to try and land on Haystack Rock and he ended up crashing on the beach. And, I mean, everyone survived so we can call him an idiot. But having this be a wildlife refuge and a marine garden, you can't legally do that anymore. Um, now we're going to talk about some fun stuff. So this is a really fit in the culture of conservation conversation that I, I'm really hoping that you guys are going to take away from this. I'm going to talk about some weird stuff. So there is a cave on the west side of Haystack Rock. This is a picture um, that, if anyone is familiar with Peter Lindsay, his book Coming Over the Rock, he has this picture in it. Um, he says he's one of these guys, this guy right here. I don't know. It's hard to tell because it's so grainy. It's a really old photo, and it's like a copy of a copy of a copy that someone found. Uh, but it is definitely in, in the cave. Um, this is another picture that someone illegally took in 2017, but they shared it on their Facebook page of the cave, because it's real. Um, and we've had some amazing low tides where you can actually access completely around the rock, which is incredible. And, you know, this kind of shows how the water comes in. I can't tell if the guy's in the, in the cave or what he's doing here. 
Um, but I wanted to show it because I've actually argued with people who've come into the museum with this exists because it's rarely accessible. And then we're gonna go bam right here. Okay, so I was doing the re research for this talk and I'm working with the Oregonian and they've been digitizing their archives. And they found this, this article. It's not complete, there's pieces missing. We think it's from 1898. It's definitely before 1900 when they changed their type print. And it's definitely after 1891 because they mentioned the Elk Creek Hotel. Um, so this story, this guy was hired to basically write a travel blog, if you will, or a travel story. So he goes to Seaside, he's spending the summer in Seaside, and he's talking about the hotels and all the things to do, and he's writing this series. We couldn't find the first part of the series. But apparently, he hears about this rock that's fun to climb. And I'm, I'm not kidding you. And I had to read this with a magnifying glass, and the scan, the, the copy is so bad. Um, so I have, there's a lot of deciphering. But So he's a young man, he gets his roommate at the place he's renting, he calls him Doc, to come with him to Cannon Beach, which they call E. Cola and Elk Creek, because prior to 1922, Cannon Beach was known as E. Cola. Um, and when he mentions Elk Creek, he's talking about the hotel, which burned down in 1913. So that also gives you a little bit of date there. Um, so he comes down and he talks about how horrible the trail was. It was awful. And then they get here and he realizes that Haystack Rock is not attached to anything. He calls the attempt to climb such a thing absurd and impossible. And as he's standing there, kind of lamenting to his friend Doc, because this is the whole reason they come to this this area, and they're you know maybe covered in mud. I don't know. Not to be super dramatic, but the trail was awful at this point in time. And this old man walks up to him, and they call him an eccentric. And they talk a little bit about his mannerisms. They say he has an accent. Um, Herbert Lo Logan, who actually built the Elk Creek Hotel, was a remittance man from Britain um, and was also known locally as quite an eccentric himself. So I, I think he may have been referring to him. Now this story is very romanticized and theatrical and definitely not a super accurate in, in, um, interpretation of the area, but you can kind of pick, pick out of there. Now what I was really crazy about, obviously this picture is nuts, but so this old man comes up and they, they talk about this cave. And he's like, yeah, there's a cave there, but you can never get in. And there's treasure in there, and I have a map. <laughs> and, there, and this young guy goes, okay, sure. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And I was thinking, man, was this Goonies? Like, did Susan Spielberg find this article or what? So this guy tells him that there was a Spanish ship that was going up the coastline and had to get stuff off of the ship because it was too heavy, which that seems like a crazy story, and that it's, it's in the cave, and I, got a, I have a map. And the map was really broken up in the, the article, but you can tell that the young guy drew it for the article. So this is very, I, not true, but I think it's a great example of this time period, kind of. And so he, this, this old man says, hey, let's build a raft, and we're going we're gonna to raft into the cave. And so his friend Doc goes, that's nuts, I'm not doing it. And the young guy's like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's totally build some rafts and just go in there. And so apparently it's really calm, because if any of you have seen Haystack Rock, there's waves, it's not that calm, but apparently it's very calm. Um, it's summer, I guess that helps. And they decide to raft in. And the cave to, in this story is, is like there's two caves, and then there's a cave within a cave, and then in that cave, they find a trunk. But they can't get it open because it's overflowing and it's too heavy, and so then their raft gets moved, and so the old man falls out, and he's washed out, and he's lost. And the article kind of, it doesn't end because it's incomplete, there's a bunch of sections gone, but basically the young guy's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna just raft back. And then he just, the very end, he just goes back to Seaside. But I thought it was crazy because I grew up here and I've never, ever heard of Spanish galleon treasure or pirates or any of this. Like, this is nuts. 
I mean, this I've never heard this. And if anyone else who's grown up here and you're like, yeah, I've heard that story, please tell me because this blew my mind. I when I came across, I had to call their archivist and, and just go, is this real? Like, did she, is this? And she said, well, this was this writer was writing a travel series, so you know how those travel writers are. And I was like, in the late 1800s, they were they were like this. So what I wondered was was Miyakami treasure that whole idea? Did he hear that story and try to integrate it into history? Because even when someone tells you a lie, even when they tell a story or there's an urban myth or some sort of legend, there's always something in it that you can see like it's cultural or you can see some history in it. And I personally felt he, he came to Canada Beach, he probably met Herbert, Herbert Logan and went, wow, this guy is crazy. I'm gonna write something about this. And then maybe he heard the story, I'm gonna bet he did never win in that cave. Like the guy was probably like, yeah, there's a cave there. And he was like, cool, I'm gonna write about it. And he wrote this really, because yeah, Herbert Logan didn't wash out, that's, I mean, he just, he got old and died. He didn't like die like this dramatic, I mean, I feel like this would have been a major newspaper article where, you know, eccentric old British remittance man washed out from the cave of his dad walk. Um, so I, I, I was really blown away by this and I wanted to share it because I've never in my life heard this. And I, ha I had to, you know, magnifying glass, I had to use my iPhone magnification and like try to put the words together. And she said, you know, we did a scan, the cover copy is obviously really good, but the other two pages of the story were torn and tattered. And so you kind of had to figure it out. And it kind of made me think of like the, like the Da Vinci Code or one of those things because, but it's not, nobody else cares. I just, as a historian, and someone who wants to figure out where these stories come through from, and these like absurd tales that we maybe tell each other, where does this come from? And was this, did this inspire me of Mountain Treasure? Or was this inspired by any county treasure? Was that Herbert Logan? Because he was, you know, he took he had a tea out on the beach and he was very, very formal. And you know, maybe to some guy from Portland on the West Coast who's like 19, was like, what accent is this? This guy is weird. <laughs> British. I mean, I, I don't know, but um, I just really, I really fell in love with this story. And it, yeah, I, and, and you can't go in the cave now, so I can't like go in there and be like, yeah, there's treasure. Um, which there's not. I can't imagine that there would be with the tides coming and going. I mean, I know the cannons were discovered but the, you know, on the in Orange Cape, but you know they're so heavy; they're just kind of rolling along the bottom of the, the shore. I mean, gold's pretty heavy. I don't know. I can't. I can't get behind this. I cannot put my stamp of approval on this the story. But I loved it because it's. We are so in love with Haystack Rock. We are so in love with it that it started in movies. It's been an integral part of myth and legend. It's in. It's been in wedding photos dog photos, uh, you know, uh, family photos, it's it, my wedding photos, I have my favorite picture of my son is in front of Haystack Rock. It's an iconic image, but it's also part of who we are as Oregonians, as much as the rain and the trees, and complaining about the rain and the trees, and that's, we're, that's what makes us who we are, and so when I see a story like this, I'm like, you know, there's this young writer who just saw this rock and fell in love with it and had to tell this really absurd story that I really hope I find the prequel and maybe it's a trilogy, maybe he was hoping to make a movie, um, you know, because now we, we can't make one, we gotta make like 15. He was, he was ready to make a series and I know like a lot of writers at this time wrote series for different publications, but not to obsess too much about this. And then I'm gonna leave you, instead of this, this picture of the weird old man and the young guy, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, it's the, you know, the bike bi plane up there. You, you cannot fly over Haystack Rock that close, you guys. Not with a drone, it's Marine Garden. So you're not gonna see this, and you're, you know, you see people on horseback, and then you've got that old, either 1910, 1920 car there, um, driving on the beach. It's just, you're not gonna see that these days. And the fun story of this is it, um, someone brought it to the museum about 15 years ago. They found it in the wall of their house. And um, I did not edit this photo at all. You can see where the tack marks are, where it was tacked up. Um, 
and it was just tacked in the wall. He has no idea why it was there. It, he was just, you know, you gotta go from knob and tube and be safe. And that's what they happened upon um, with a lot of newspapers too. Uh, so this is one of my favorite photos. But I'm gonna leave you guys with this, and if you have any questions about some history with Haystack Rock, or if you've heard some crazy weird legend about treasure in the cave at Haystack Rock, <laughs> please let me know. But otherwise, um, there's people from Friends of Haystack Rock who can talk to you about the birds, and the marine life, and the tide pools, because I, I, I can't even say the Lola, the Vola, the Lola, that wash up. Yeah, I usually just show people, I have like a printout, I'm like, that's what those things are. They make the beach kind of smell, and they look like little blue tiny jelly cells, uh, like from sail, sailboat. Um, they're very cool, very pretty to take pictures of, but I um, thank you all so much for having me and coming tonight. Oh, God, what a turnout. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, anybody have any questions for her? It, she'll be hanging around uh, up here afterwards. You can come and talk to her. And be sure to stop uh, back there and talk to Angela and her group for the Friends of Haystack Rock. Um, Actually, last night I was at another history pub. Uh, there was one about the uh, Flight 173 that crashed in Portland in uh, December 28, 1978. It actually crashed in the, basically the backyard of where we were living at the time. So we felt we had a little bit of a connection to it, but uh, there was a book that came out. Anyway, it was history pub at uh, Grand Lodge in Forest Grove. So McMinnons has a uh, one started there now. The Friends of Forest Grove uh, group in Forest Grove are the ones that are helping get that going. So we'll be posting that to our Facebook page. If you have a hobby like I do of going to history pubs, there you go. Um, it is an hour and 10 minutes away, but uh, so what? Drive as far as you want to for history, right? Okay, next, next month we have another really great one, the first time they've been down here. How many are familiar with the Carriage Museum in Raymond? Yes. The, the, uh, there's a husband and wife that, that basically are run it, one's director, the other is the, uh, he is the guy that will be talking. Um, uh, let's see, Greg, Jerry, Jerry Bowman will be uh, speaking and showing us all kinds of period uh, carriages, you know, all the way from sleighs, really old, to, you know, a little bit newer. And, uh, you know, there, there'll be ones that you see in a lot of the pictures uh, that the museum has, or, you know, you see on Facebook, or whatever, where there's a carriage in the photo. Helps you date what that, uh, that picture was from. But there's tremendous stories behind these. And if you ever have a chance, the museum's up in Raymond, which is about an hour's drive from here. And uh, you really need to stop in Raymond. That's the place, uh, that's really the reason to go to Raymond uh, for anybody in the kind of Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Don't tell Jerry I said that. <laughs> but it's great because they will show you, they have a sign on, on just about every one that says, this type of carriage was in this movie or that movie, you know, like Gone with the Wind. You know, there there will be the ones that, and so you'll say, yeah, I recognize that, that's my favorite movie. So looking forward to having them here uh, next month. The, uh, what day? The last Thursday of February, yeah. Whatever, I don't know what the date is. But uh, again, uh, we're sponsored uh, by Seaside Museum. And if you have a chance, please, uh, oh, I don't know if this got back there. This, this is the sign up if you want a uh, email reminder on the Monday before the event. And as you saw tonight, you ought to really get here about 5.30. I got here at five and there were about 30 people here already. And uh, I, I basically had to save myself a seat and my wife so that we had a place to sit. But uh, we'll pass this back. If you don't get to it, come up and find it. Um, pass it back down on the table here. And uh, that way you'll get a reminder of what it is. We, we try to get as much word out as we can, although 
based on the amount of people here tonight, I'm wondering if uh, we should worry about that too much. We've got a, you know, a lot of you, actually I'd like, that's one thing I'd like to see. How many are here for the first time? Oh wow, great, terrific. And uh, you know, a lot, uh, some of the people are people are just here for the weekend and they, they saw it, there's something to do. And others of you are longtime attenders because you know you'll get a speaker like Elaine that is just uh, in, impressive uh, for all the stories she can tell. Uh, particularly since she grew up in the area. Uh, so anyway, that's next month. You know, if you can support the museum, we've got uh, uh, it's our renewal time for our, our memberships. There's uh, forms on the back of the newsletters. If you don't see one, come and see me. Have any other questions about for Elaine or Angela? Go ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you.